Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. The Roundabout Murder, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, change is my stock and trade. If trouble is a noose around your neck and it's getting tighter, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, they say I killed Cleo Dawson, and I did kill her. But I didn't murder her. There is a difference. My story may sound weak, even ridiculous, but it's true. Yet what chance do I stand? My own lawyer doesn't believe me. My wife turns away when I try to explain. The police say I'm not even a good liar. I don't know why I should should expect expect you you not only to believe me, but help me do something about it. Let's say right now, I'm just grabbing at straws. It's signed Arnold Kyle. You don't have to look at me like that, Miss Brooks. I know all about that letter. I saw it before it was mailed. Oh. I don't get it, Lieutenant. This may put us on opposite sides of the fence. (laughs) Since when does that bother you, Valentine? Anyway, just between you and me and that blindfolded lady called Justice, I want you to see what you can do for this guy. Well, I've never known you to undermine your own case, Lieutenant. Miss Brooks, you haven't met Arnold Kyle. He looks at you with those big, blue, innocent eyes, and he makes you feel all dirty all over for even questioning that simple-minded story of his. I tell you, I can't sleep. I wake up dreaming about his open-faced <laughs> okay, mug and I... Okay, you sentimental Irishman. Pull up your suspenders and tell me what's making this such a hassle for you. The facts, the facts. You can't beat them, Valentine. Now get this picture and tell me what you do. Yeah? We're up in Cleo Dawson's cheap hotel room. The coroner had just examined her body. Arnold Kyle's been standing there all the time, taking it all in. All right, all right. You heard the coroner, Mr. Kyle. This isn't suicide. This girl was killed by some quick-acting poison and whiskey. Now, what do you know about it? Nothing, nothing, I tell you. Who is she? Cleo Dawson, here from somewhere in the Middle West. I just met her two days ago. Well, you work fast, don't you? What were you doing up here in this room tonight? She came out here to get a job with a carnival. It didn't pan out. She was stranded without a cent. And so you decided to play the good Samaritan. Well, what's wrong with that? If my kid sister were in a jam like that, wouldn't I be glad if someone tried to help her? Uh, uh, Never mind that. Uh, Go on, go on. I got Cleo this room and even fixed it with a friend so she could start working today at a drive-in downtown. Come on, what about tonight? Well, she didn't show up at the job, so I dropped by to see what was the matter. She had a rotten cold, so I told her she ought to take a drink and stay in bed. Kyle, why did you poison this bottle? Did Cleo threaten to make trouble between you and your wife? Don't be crazy. It was nothing like that. I was going to take a drink myself. Except all of a sudden, she keeled over, just like that. Okay. Where did you buy this liquor? I... I didn't buy it. Huh? Some fella gave it to me. A guy down at Donovan's Tavern, name of Walt. I never met him before. If I told you that story, would you believe it? But it's the truth. Why would I call downstairs for a doctor? Why didn't I run away? Nobody knew I was here. If I were guilty, would I... There you are. That's the story, Valentine. Now, come on. Come on, Kyle. St- uh, cell is right down this car. Well, now you're going to have Brooksy and me sharing your insomnia, Lieutenant. I don't suppose you found any stranger named Walt? Yeah, don't think we haven't tried. Well, here we are. Okay. I think it'll be better if you wait for me downstairs, Angel, and we'll have dinner. I shouldn't be very long. Okay, George. Here's somebody to see you, Kyle. Oh, drop by and see me before you leave, Ballard. Ah, uh, sure. Yes? What... What do you want with me? My name's Valentine, George Valentine. Oh, then you don't think my story is crazy, do you? You wouldn't be here, would you? Now, calm down, will you? No, no, look at me. What makes me such a freak because I tried to help a poor girl who was down on her luck? And I know how the rest of it sounds, too, but... We don't have to go over that now. I've already checked. Well? How about this man in Donovan's tavern who gave you the bottle of whiskey? Can you remember anything about him? I mean, something that might have slipped your mind when you were talking to the police? Well, that's the trouble. He... He looked like a dozen other people you might meet in a place like that. He wore a leather jacket and... Yes, sir? Sure. Sure, there is something. Something that made me notice him in the first place. He wore one of those wide, studded leather belts. The kind you see on guys when they're driving motorcycles. Uh Huh? Well, what did this Walt say to you when he offered you the bottle? Now, I want his exact words. Let me see. Uh, He said, uh... Here, maybe you'd like to have this, mister... Morrison Club. The best. But I don't want it because I got no use for the Joe who gave it to me. And you ended up at Cleo's with your present. 
Oh, what's the use? It's even beginning to sound cockeyed to me. Now, listen, Arnold, you stuck to your guns so far. This is no time to run out on yourself. I know. We're but... going to go over everything that happened that night till it comes out of your ears, and then some more. Now, shove over so I can sit down. Oh, George, I want you to meet Charlie Drake. Huh? He's been waiting for you, too. Oh, what can I do for you, friend? You can brace yourself for a big moment, Valentine. I'm supposed to present you to that nationally known radio commentator and high caliph of corn, Wayne Medford. Hey, what is this? What's the gag? Well, you know his program, Big Dramas in Small Lives. I'm sorry, Brooksy. I'm strictly a Terry and the Pirates addict. I dig up the Great One's material and write it for him so he can prove to the world that he can read. Uh -huh. uh, he does have a honeysuckle baritone, though. Now, look, Drake, I'm in a hurry. Medford's interested in the Arnold Kyle case. Oh. Uh, he thinks he might make it a cause celeb. Big dramas and small lives. Uh-uh, nothing doing. I'm not supplying any grist for a cornmill. This isn't just another human interest story. Hmm, touchy. The truth is, he thinks he can help you. He's got something on his mind. Why don't you hear him out? Shall we go? Drink, Miss Brooks, Mr. Valentine. Don't you find it disconcerting, Medford, having a bar in your office? And so well stocked. What's worth doing is worth doing well. Wayne always says, uh, don't you? We can do without your sarcasm, Charlie. Here, Valentine, take a look at this bottle. Morrison Club. But that's the same brand the man in the bar gave Arnold Kyle. Exactly. That's what first attracted me to this extraordinary case. This is the only kind of whiskey I drink. I always have a nightcap here at the office after I finish my next day's program. Yep. Wayne is a stickler about that. He always likes to read what I've written for him at least once before he gets on the Look, air. I'm wasting an awful lot of my client's time. Very well. Here's the point. First, the coincidence of the brand name. It intrigues me. And then I discover that the plight of Arnold Kyle, caught up in a web of incredible circumstance, is the very stuff that makes the heart of my program big dramas in small lives. I believe Mr. Drake mentioned something about you being able to help. And I can. I happen to know, Valentine, that Arnold Kyle isn't too well fixed for money. Don't let that limit your investigations. I'll foot the bills, including your fee. Well, now, that's very generous. What's in it for you? Naturally, I shall dramatize the cause of Arnold Kyle on my program, including all the new facts you bring to light. Oh, naturally. But it can only help. Someone may even come forward with information about that man in the leather jacket, perhaps, and other information you might not ordinarily get. What do you say, Valentine? Well, I... Oh, Mr. Medford, excuse me. You'll have to come back, Molly. I thought maybe you were after dinner and I'd have a chance to clean your office, but... Eric can wait. Oh, no, no, Molly, come here. I'll show you what I mean, Valentine. Yes, Mr. Medford? I was just talking to these good people about your son, Molly. I'm sure they'd like to hear more about him. My boy. He's a big man now. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Only four years ago, he was a nobody. Then he went east to a town named Clinton, New York. He's the biggest lawyer there now, makes hundreds of dollars a week. And he's married to a beautiful society girl, isn't he? Oh, yes. You see this belt I'm wearing, miss? Yes, Molly. It's all hand-woven. He sent it to my sister to give to me if she ever ran across me. You see, he doesn't know where I am. I don't want him to. All his friends might find out that his mother's just a poor... Ignorant woman who scrubs floors. Oh, well, excuse me. I have to get on with my work. Oh, uh, Molly, how are you feeling these days? I know why you asked me that, Mr. Drake. Well, I promised the building manager I wouldn't touch a drop. And I won't. See what I mean, Valentine? Yes, I see, Medford. Big dramas and small lives. Yes. Lord knows what her son is really like. But she has her illusions. Could Hollywood dream up anything more corny? All right, you're a slave to your hobby. Let's put it this way, then. All you want is to see justice done, one way or the other, in the life of one little man named Arnold Kyle, is that it? Valentine, I couldn't put it better myself. Okay. 
Since you're my client, too, I'd better get busy and stop loafing on your time. Nah, nah, not at Donovan's. Our customers can't afford to drink Morrison's, let alone give it away. The man was wearing a leather jacket. Yeah, and one of those wide motorcycle belts. Nah, nah. Look, this is my busy time. Can I get you something beside conversation? Nah, nah, Buster. Let's get out of here, Buster. Here, just a minute, Angel. What's the matter? You're not going back in there. Don't you know when you're as welcome as a crack in a glass the eye? The bartender made a beeline straight for the phone booth. Uh-huh. I'll be right with you, Bussy. <laughs> It's about time you answered the phone, lady. Let's go up to Walt Nielsen's room and call him, will you? Tell him it's Chester over at Donovan's place. All right, then. Wake him up if he's sleeping. It's important. Thank you, Chester. I know it's kind of late to be phoning, Mr. Grant, but as president of the Dead Ever Motorcycle Club, you shouldn't mind a little excitement. Pardon me? Well, I just have to get Walt Nielsen's address and telephone number so I can tell him I can't go riding with him tomorrow. Me. Oh, don't be silly, Mr. Grant. I bet Walt has dozens of girlfriends. I'll wait. You were right, George. This Walt character is a man. Good, good. Oh, yes, Mr. Grant. Yeah, I'm putting it down. Rooming house at... Yeah, yeah. Oh. Oh, I don't know how to thank you. Parmy. Oh, and happy motorcycling to you, too, Mr. Grant. <laughs> That must be his room right ahead, George. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out what to expect, how to approach this character. What do you mean, darling? Now we know Kyle is telling the truth. There is a man named Walt, and he's hiding out. But why? Well, he did pass on the bottle of poison liquor that killed Cleo Dawson. Well, even if he did it innocently, he's not too anxious to show his face. Well, there's another angle. According to Arnold, Walt had some kind of a fight with the person who gave him the bottle. If Nielsen was marked for murder, maybe that's why he's holding up there. Hi, Paul. Oh. Hey, what are you doing here, Drake? Don't worry. It wasn't another coincidence. I was following you. That wasn't part of my deal with Medford. Yeah, I know, but uh, I like to be close to the news when and if it happens. Well, you're real close now, Buster. But just stay from under my feet. See that the gentleman isn't bored, Brooksy. I got work to do. Okay. All the way in, Bob, and stand over there. Okay, Walt. I never play AC Ducey with a 38. Huh. So you've been packing? Yeah, leaving town. All on account of that crazy bottle of liquor. I should have thrown it down a sewer, but no, I gotta go be nice to somebody. A guy I never even seen before. Who gave the bottle to you, Walt? And why? You're getting nothing out of me, copper. Nothing but this! Just to make sure I got enough time. Hey, you. <laughs> Crazy bottle of liquor. We'll return to tonight's adventure, George Valentine, in just a moment. Have you ever known it to fail the one time you want to get someplace in a hurry, your car decides it just won't start fast? If that's happened to you, better switch to high-octane Chevron Supreme gasoline, for it has just the right amount of light fractions to assure fast starts every time you use the starter. And that's just the beginning of the command performance you get from your car when you use this premium-quality motor fuel. Its special blending agents command smooth, steady acceleration, and all the extra power your car needs on rugged hills. And besides those advantages, it's climate-tailored to each different altitude and temperature zone in the West. No wonder folks everywhere say, Chevron Supreme keeps my car going steady. Try Chevron Supreme tomorrow. Get it at independent Chevron gas stations and at standard stations, where they say and mean, we take better care of your car. Now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. 
A man pours a girl a drink from a bottle. The young lady promptly dies. Said man, who winds up as your client, protests he didn't mean to do it. He says a stranger gave him the lethal bottle as a present. So, surprising even yourself, you find that big-hearted stranger, and he has a present for you, too. A sculling that's a work of art. If you're like George Valentine, when you come to, the recently acquired lump doesn't keep you from asking... Oh, Brooksy. Why did Walt Nielsen jump me like that? What made him so desperate? Darling, please sit down. Oh. You don't know what corner you're in. You're woozy. Oh, never mind about me. I think better walking around in circles. Now, what was that you said about Charlie Drake? Oh, okay, maybe this time it'll sink in. When I saw a man come out of the house with a bag, yeah. I thought it might be Walt. Yeah, yeah. So, when he hopped a cab, I told Charlie to follow him in his car. Uh -huh. Then I found you sprawled out here on the floor. All right, okay. There's only one answer about Walt, Angel, and it's got to be that. Got to be what, George? It says in all the textbooks they give rookie detectives, murder has to have a motive. Walt had nothing against Arnold. Kyle didn't even know him. Yeah, that's right. So Walt thought the liquor was okay. He was still another innocent go-between for this flagon of coffin varnish. And that's something he could explain to the police. Well, he's trying to hide something else. Something he can't afford to talk over with the police. But where's the beginning of all this, oh, George? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. It may go back to the person who gave it to Walt or even further back than that. Oh, Angel, this seems to be a very roundabout murder. Hmm. Well, Charlie said he was going to call us here on the hall phone as soon as he finds out where Walt is headed. Ah, it's 11 o'clock now. Oh, what a game, Brooksy. Bottle, bottle, who passed the bottle? Hello. Valentine? Yeah, Charlie, what'd you find? I followed your man. That was Nielsen, all right. He stopped off at a flea bag called the Palace Hotel down on Ritter Street. Uh huh? I saw him take the self-service elevator, and then I slipped the desk clerk a fin, and she told me that our friend always visits somebody called Tim Farrell in 4F. Well, is Nielsen there now? No, he only stayed a few minutes. I followed him to the Union Station, then I got fouled up with the traffic lights, and I lost him. I see. Well, that's about it, Valentine. Okay, thanks a lot, Charlie. Sorry to put you to the trouble, but I was, uh... Indisposed. See you in the morning. Tim Farrell? No, I didn't see him go out. Shall I ring him? Never mind, lady. He's expecting us. The elevator's right across the lobby. Oh, there's no boy on it. Only self-service after 12 o'clock. We'll manage. <gasps> Easy, Brooksy. Oh... This lets Tim Farrell out as a source of information. Yeah. yeah. Walt didn't do a very neat job. But you can't say he wasn't thorough. Well, Valentine, it's about time you showed up. Tell me, Lieutenant, what did you find out about the late Tim Farrell? Well, I got it right here. Timothy Farrell, age 28... Crimes include illegal entry, assault, armed robbery, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Committed to Dannemora State Penitentiary January 4, 1945, and oh, so on, so on. So In on. other words, just a cheap crook. Yes, yes, but this, this is the payoff. Lately, he's been teaming up with Walt Nielsen. Huh? Well, that is something. And Nielsen is a really a bad boy. A three-time loser. One more arrest, and he'd have to collect his old-age pension in jail. So that's what it was, then, that's why I'd have none of the police. Yeah, so now it lines up like this. They have a fight, and Tim tries to slip his pal a Mickey Finn that works for keeps. Before leaving town, Walt drops by the Palace Hotel and slits Timothy's throat. Yeah, it could be. And just where does that leave Arnold Kyle? Well, right where he is. Why? Well, at least until we pick up Nielsen. After he talks, then our saintly hero can go home to his wife. I'm... Oh, hold on a second. Hello? Yeah, let's have it, Thompson. Huh? What? <sighs> yes, yes. Okay. Well, what is it, Riley? Oh, of all the things to have happen. Now, this, this. What is this? Where's this case going to wind up? Now it's Walt Nielsen. They found him. Well, what's the matter with that? Where is he? They found him last night on the railroad tracks. He either jumped, fell, or was pushed off the Garland Street Bridge. Gee, baby. Then the train got him. The 1140 Coastliner. Valentine? 
Valentine, I want you to trace this thing back one more step. Don't you see? Someone who still has his heart set on murder is walking around loose. Yeah, I don't oh. know that for a fact. Well, man, why do you stand oh. here? Why... Dear, here I go walking in again before you're ready to leave. <laughs> Please excuse me, Mr. Medford. I... That's all right, Molly. Hey, Molly. Uh, Have you heard any more exciting news about your son? My son? What's the matter? Aren't you feeling well? I... Oh, I, I'm fine. I, I'll clean up when I come around later. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Medford. Excuse me. About my son, mister. I can tell you he's better off now than he ever was. Ah, uh, poor creature. Well, Valentine, we're still in business, aren't we? Uh-huh. At least until I find out one thing. What's that? How a man can be murdered after 12 o'clock by someone who was dead at least 20 minutes before the witching hour. You mind shedding a little light on that, Valentine? Yeah. Soon now, gentlemen, very soon. Come on, let's go, Brooksy. Whether you know it or not, you're a very important witness to this discrepancy in time. Am I? Well, what do you know? I'll be in touch with you, gentlemen. Good night. Good night. What do we do, George? Stand here and count ten before we go back in? That ought to be enough time if I'm right. Well, it's a long way from Cleo Dawson's hotel room to... It begins. George! Oh, golly! Oh, my shoulder! Uh, he shot me! I'll oh. take that, Medford. Oh, but listen, Valentine. Don't you I... stand there give me a doctor! Brooksy, help me get Charlie on the yeah, couch. Yeah, George, Just as soon as you and Miss Brooks left, he came at me with a lot of wild talk. Oh. I just got the gun out of the desk drawer, but I didn't shoot him. What are you talking about? You'll see when they get the bullet out of him. The he... shot came through the French doors on the balcony. Where does that balcony lead? It goes right around the building. I just thought of something. Brooksy. Yeah. Oh. Call Lieutenant Riley and tell him what happened. Medford and I will be right back. Okay. Valentine, I was prepared for almost anything in this fantastic... Go ahead, Ann Molly. Now I have your gun. Please, Lieutenant Riley. I don't know the answers myself yet. Oh, all right. Goodbye. Well, friends, now the circle is neatly closed. I don't understand. That bottle of Morrison Club came from this office. I should have known that when Lieutenant Riley read the late Tim Farrell's police record. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, Molly. Your son, wasn't he? Oh. You tried to build him into something decent in your mind. Big lawyer in Clinton, New York. That's where the Danamora State Penitentiary is. Big success in four years. That was the length of Tim's term. He was committed in 45. Yeah, that's right. Now I remember. And this leather belt you're so proud of, Molly. This is what the prisoners make in the Danamora workshops. Oh. All right. Now you know, mister. Tim got that bottle from you, didn't he, Molly? Yes. I, I stole it from your bar, Mr. Medford. Tim took it away from me because I'm not supposed to drink. But who poisoned it and why? You may as well answer that, Charlie. And you know you can. Uh, all right, Valentine. I, I poisoned the liquor. If people hadn't started passing it around, this egotistical windbag here would have been called just another suicide. I knew it was you, Charlie. That's why I hired Valentine and didn't want him to stop until he found out the truth. But Walt and Tim. Unfortunate casualties, Miss Brooks, just like Cleo Dawson. Except with them, I was forced to get rid of them if I was going to save my own neck. I thought the whole thing was your fault because you hated Mr. Medford. That's why I carried the gun. It was Tim's. Tonight from the balcony, I heard you admit what you did, and I... Oh, I wish I had killed you. Now, Mrs. Farrell. Sorry, Medford, but this is one story you'll have to write for yourself. But uh, how about a switch, huh? A small drama in the life of a man who couldn't stand to see you so big. You don't know what a relief it was to send Arnold Kyle home to his ever-loving wife. Yeah, I can imagine, Lieutenant. <laughs> you know, the public ought to know more about this sentimental streak in our police offices. Well, it's a fact. That guy was beginning to gnaw on my conscience. I couldn't sleep. I walked up and down all night, and Mrs. Riley thought I was going crazy. <laughs> George, I'm still not quite <clears throat> sure about what you meant by <clears throat> discrepancy in time. Well, Charlie Drake understood. That's why he went after Medford the moment we left the room. If he was going to get caught, at least he was going to finish what he started. 
Well, I know Walt Nielsen was hit by the 1140 Coast Liner, but... Uh... But Charlie told me on the phone that he saw Walt use the self-service elevator at the Palace Hotel. And you'll remember the clerk said it became self-service only after midnight. Oh, yeah, that's right. Charlie Drake pushed Walt off the bridge, then came back and killed Tim Farrell. Because he had to use the self-service elevator, he took it for granted that that's the way it worked all the time. Isn't George positively brilliant, Lieutenant? Oh, fine. <laughs> back to normal again. Now it's Mrs. Riley's turn to stay awake all night. If you're looking for ways to tighten up your budget, how about the family car? Particularly the care of your car's engine. Of course, you can pick an oil at random and hope for the best, but for protection you trust, get compounded RPM motor oil. It's as plain as the nose on anybody's face that a clean engine is going to run longer with less wear and fewer repair bills than a dirty one. And keeping your car's motor clean by fighting off carbon deposits is just one of the money-saving jobs done by this premium quality motor oil. RPM also rust proofs as it lubricates internal engine parts, prevents corrosion, and sticks to hot spots left bare by ordinary oils. No wonder, for economy's sake, RPM motor oil is first choice in the West. To make things easier for your car and your pocketbook, get RPM tomorrow. You can get it at standard stations and at independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Next week, when we catch up with George Valentine in his office, there'll be a ring on the phone and then... Hello? Hello? Hello, Valentine. Oh, yeah. Now, listen, friend, what's this all about? You sound as though you know who this is. I should. You said you'd call at this hour. But assuming you did kill those three people... Tomorrow, I'm going to kill again. I'm even going to give you the name of the victim. George Valentine. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Brooksy. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Byron Kane as Kyle, Larry Dobkin as Medford, Herbert Vigran as Drake, and Virginia Gregg as Molly. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. <laughs>